brothers and sisters in Christ, as we look at our gospel reading today, as I say in our opening, there are many different things that we could pull out of this, and certainly many different lessons that we can preach on today. But I've got to think about the idea of age, as Jesus talks about being like children, and what age looks like in our culture today. Many people would say that in our culture, youth is celebrated. All of our advertising appeals to youth, all of the marketing is focused on the youth of our society. For us who are older, it might be a, a goal to look younger, to act younger, to do things that we did when we were younger. And as age comes and as the effects of age come, we miss the things that we could do when we were younger because certainly youth is celebrated in our society. With all that being said, it's also interesting that in this same society that seems to celebrate youth over the elderly, both political parties, leading candidates for the coming election in 2024, have much older men as their candidates. There is an interesting discussion going on in Washington right now about how old is too old to serve in public office? Between our presidential candidates, between congressmen and senators, octogenarians, people aging and up, well beyond the normal age of retirement, are the ones making very important decisions and leading our country. And so recently we've heard this question, how old is too old? Many of us recognize that the age of retirement, the average age of retirement was 65, I think it's been increased to 67 or 68 now, but either way, it is much below where many of these people in political office are serving. As we are young, we are always looking forward to the next thing, the next age, the next time in our lives that sets some kind of landmark. A young person might be looking forward to turning 16 so they can drive a car for the first time, or turning 18 so they can vote, or turning 21 so they can buy certain things at the grocery store, or by turning 35 so they can also run for president. We have a minimum age of president, but we don't have a maximum age yet. But it seems like we are always aspiring for what's next. What is coming in our lives? What is the next thing we get to do because we are finally old enough? As I asked the children in the children's message, what do you want to be when you grow up? Almost everybody had an answer. Because we're always thinking about what's next. But Jesus says in our gospel text today that greatness, greatness in the kingdom of heaven is not to look ahead to being older and wiser and more experienced, but rather he says, turn and become like children. Become like the children that you see before us today. Humble yourself like a child. Now this is not age discrimination. Jesus is not saying you're too old to be a Christian, you need to be younger, but rather it is a mindset that Jesus wants us to have, to have the mind of Christ and to celebrate childlikeness, to celebrate being a child of God. I think there's a few things that Jesus wants, to, wants us to focus on as we go through all of these other teachings that we have in Matthew chapter 18 that are all connected to the child 
and the little ones. First he says, receive the little ones. Receive the children. Welcome them. Be glad that they are here. We are certainly grateful for all of the children we have in our congregation, the children that began attending Sunday school today, we are grateful that their parents have brought them to this place so that they may receive and hear the Word of God and learn the Word of God and put their faith in that Word of God. And as I said in the children's sermon, we hope that this is something that isn't just for kids, but we hope that this sticks with them for the rest of their lives, that they will be faithful to the Lord, as we are faithful to the Lord, for the rest of their lives, even into old age. But then Jesus said, do not cause these little ones to sin. Set examples of faith for them. Now, truth be told, we as adults are always setting examples for our children, for our children, but they are not always examples of faith, are they? We might be unintentionally teaching our kids how to do what is against God's will. We might unintentionally be teaching our children how to sin. Jesus sets before us to set good examples, positive examples, faithful examples for our children, to teach them good spiritual habits, to teach them how to read devotions, how to read the Bible, how to pray, to pray with them, to set that example for them. And in worship, let the children see you singing. Let the children see you give offerings to the church. Let the children see you go to Bible study. All of these are excellent habits that we want to teach our kids, not just for while they are young, but for the rest of their life. Faithful habits that they can apply for the rest of their life to continue as they are children of God. Second point Jesus said, do not despise the children. Do not despise them because they don't know as much as you, or do not act the way you want them to. Do not despise them. They are indeed gifts of God and their kids. Show them grace. Show them grace just as your Father in heaven has shown you grace. And then Jesus says this very mysterious little thing here. He says, their angels, these children's angels, always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. These children have angels. You have angels. This is one of the very few verses in the Bible where we get the idea of guardian angels, of being assigned a specific angel that is just there to look out for you. Now, if this is the case, if we each have a guardian angel, an angel that is assigned to us, I think it's fascinating to see, look at what these angels are doing on our behalf. Look at where they're at. They are before the face of God Almighty. They're not hovering around like an umbrella, watching everything I do and making sure that I don't step in a puddle or walk into the road when a car is coming. No, they are always before the face of God, advocating for His children, praying to Him, asking God himself to look over you, to watch over you, to guard and protect you from every physical threat and every spiritual threat. And God provides. God provides for us in every physical need. He does this largely by providing us with people to look out for us. In our reading from Romans 13, it says God has provided the government for this purpose, to look over you, to watch you, to protect you, to guard you from every evil. And if somebody among us has done evil, the government is there bearing the sword to punish that evil so that you 
you can be saved. Yes. Whether guardian angel or government, God provides protection for his children. And then third, Jesus says, when the little ones wander, seek them out. Just like a shepherd sees the one sheep out of a hundred who has gone astray, so also our Father in heaven seeks that one child of his to bring him back into the fold, to bring him back into the congregation of God, into the community of saints. Yes, God cares for each of you individually. Each of you, as his own child, God cares. God cares so much that he says, when your brother sins against you, do not let them go astray. Do not let them stay out there unattended. But rather, when your brother sins against you, go to him. Talk with him. Let him know how he has sinned against you so that you can bring him to repentance. And in forgiveness, you can come back together once again as part of the family of God, fellow children of God, fellow heirs with Christ. And of course, if he doesn't listen to you, then we bring others along with the goal always to bring them back, always for reconciliation. Help him to turn from his evil ways. Help him to turn and become like a little child. Notice here, Jesus does not command us to celebrate children or to exalt children, to say that children should dictate how we live as adults. Jesus does not say any of this. Rather, he says to become like children. You are a child of God. And what does this mean to you? Not to exalt yourself in your greatness, but rather to humble yourself and admit your needs. Not to boast in our righteous deeds, but rather, as we did this morning, to confess our sins and our needs for a Savior. Not to hide from our Good Shepherd, but to humbly let him find us and submit to him, caring for us. To submit to Jesus is to be a child of God. To come before him at this altar and say, I come with empty hands. Please fill them. That is what it means to be a child of God. Yes, dear brothers and sisters of Christ, to be a child in the church is none other than that you confess your need for our Father who is in heaven. Our Father who gives us gifts beyond compare. Our Father who provides for all of our needs, spiritual and physical. Our Father who has called you, his children, by the waters of holy baptism. And as his children, promises to meet your needs all the way to eternal life. So whether you are a newborn baby, or whether you are a 90-year-old man, become like a child, a child of God, an heir of his kingdom, somebody who God dearly loves and sent his only son to die for. In the name of Jesus, now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.